Good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Please uh, attend yourself to the uh, Grand Rounds question of the month and uh, submit it with your form. Uh, this morning we have the privilege of having Dr. David Wallinga uh, from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Wallinga wishes to note that he has no financial disclosures. Uh, Dr. Wallinger is currently uh, the founder of Healthy Food Action uh, and uh, co-founder of uh, Keeping Antibiotics or Keep Antibiotics Working, uh, both involved in the area of agricultural use of antibiotics and implications for humans. Dr. Wallinger received his bachelor's degree in government from Dartmouth College, his MD degree from the University of Minnesota, postgraduate training at Hennepin County Medical Center, and a master's in public and international fail, uh, affairs, uh, science and technology policy certificate from Princeton University. For many years, Dr. Wallinger has been involved in activities uh, at the interface of human uh, nutrition, uh, agriculture, and has been a, a consultant in health and changing communities and food systems. Uh, he has received a number of awards and has uh, numerous publications in this area. Without further ado, I'll introduce to you Dr. Wallinger. Well, good morning and thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, talking about a topic that I've been working on for quite a few years, but which I dare say is going to be uh, fairly new to many of you. Um, so as uh, Dr. Anderson said, I'm a, a local boy, grew up in Roseville, uh, did my training here, and lived just up the road in Snelling. But the, I, I've been working uh, both around the science and policy of this issue sort of nationally for several years. And what I wanted to do for you today is kind of tie what you all do in a clinical setting to a bigger uh, context around antibiotic resistance. And so I'm gonna talk generally about the threat of antimicrobial resistance, talk about it as an ecological issue, uh, and then finish up talking a little bit about the good news in terms of some steps forward and some ways to address the problems. So none of this uh, hopefully will be new to you that folks have been talking for quite a while uh, about the end of the antibiotic era. Um, but what is notable is that the, um, the warnings are getting more dire and appropriately, I think, because it's been tough to sort of raise this issue on the plate of policymakers and the public. And so just in the last couple of years, you've seen these kind of statements from the WHO Director General, and then most recently, the Surgeon General equivalent in the UK, Sally Davies, warning of this catastrophic threat of you know, people not really having antibiotics when they need them, even for routine infections, which can then turn life-threatening. And then most recently, uh, Tom Frieden, the CDC director, accompanying this really important report, which I recommend to you that the CDC put out uh, in the fall, um, called Antibiotic Resistance Threats. And um, there's many sections and a lot of great graphics. They obviously <coughs> paid a fair amount of attention to the communication to the public. Um, um, but for example, uh, one of the sections deals with running out of drugs to treat resistant gram-negative infections. They also, for the first time, really tried to bead down on what the, what the toll is in terms of Americans getting resistant infections, whether nosocomial infections or community acquired, and then deaths. And um, these are the numbers they came up with. And they, they made a point of saying these are lowball estimates. It's a floor. They wanted numbers that were kind of unassailable, but the actual numbers are probably higher and maybe much higher. We're not really doing a good job at comprehensively tracking the 
uh, incidence and prevalence of resistant infections. There's a dollar toll, too, um, not only in hospital, uh, but uh, out of hospital, too. Um, so there's both direct costs and societal costs. And what is newer is uh, an increasingly refined as an attempt to uh, really quantify those costs. So you're seeing figures on the order of $20 billion in uh, extra or additional medical costs from treating resistant infections versus treating infections that are non-resistant. And then maybe an additional, or, or with the total number going up to maybe $55 billion when you add in these societal costs like lost work and productivity. So <clears throat> really the meat of the talk and my whole approach has been, and I'm not a microbiologist or an ID doc, has been um, talking to folks around an, an ecological lens on the whole resistance phenomenon. And you're, hopefully you're going to see why I'm doing that. But um, pardon the cartoons, I like them. Uh, I think they make it a little fun. But, but basically it's going back to Darwin here on the left and uh, really applying his theories of natural selection to the microbial environment. So we all know this story. We're starting with a population. Hopefully, uh, most of the bugs are susceptible. Some are resistant. And then we apply this selection pressure in the form of antibiotics. And uh, if, if the doses are high enough, the susceptible bugs die off. And what we're left with is these propagating resistant bugs. So, in this scenario, very simplified admittedly, what's driving resistance is the extent of antibiotic use. And then the reservoirs that exist of the resistance determinants. So those uh, could be reservoirs in bacteria. As we're going to see, they can also be reservoirs in the broader environment, reservoirs in hospitals. One, one aspect that's important to, to, to my theme but which people overlook is the, is the way in which the resistance determinants are physically linked. So most of you probably know this, that they can be physically linked on things like integrons or transposons, plasmids. And so when bacteria go from being more susceptible to more resistant, they're acquiring resistance not just to a single antibiotic, but many times to multiple antibiotics. And as a result, uh, the creation or the spread of multi-drug resistance can happen quite quickly. Of course, the generation time for bacteria is very short, too, so that further uh, uh, speeds up the process. And then the other thing to note is that because of this physical linkage, it's not just exposure to one antibiotic that we need to worry about, but exposure to any of the antibiotics on that physically linked segment of DNA. And so exposure to one can increase resistance to another. And think about that when I start talking about the use of antibiotics in the, in the animal setting, in the livestock setting. So Stuart Levy is a very well-known microbiologist and physician at Tufts who for years, literally decades, has been uh, trumpeting the horn around antibiotic resistance and the threat that it uh, entails. And so I just pulled a quote from uh, a, an article that he did in Scientific American, a great, a great article that's still relevant. And he points out that if you think about this, this schema, the, the way that resistance is transferred and the pervasiveness of the exchange of these DNA fragments between bacteria, between the bacteria and the environment, between viruses and bacteria. Um, really, it's not crazy to think of the whole world as basically one big uh, uh, microbial ecosystem. And in that ecosystem is us, and our hospitals, and our farms, and our homes, and the human gut the food supply, fish ponds, sewage treatment plants, 
any place where there's bacteria, which of course is any place, right? And the, the CDC report that I started off talking about actually acknowledges this. Uh, one of the infographics that they created, which I think is great, is this one. And it makes it clear that, um, is this my pointer? That in terms of what you all are thinking about on this side of the equation is really just part of the equation. And then there's this whole other side that I'm going to talk about. So I'm not in any way minimizing the importance, but rather saying that to be fair in terms of thinking about the problem as well as what we do about it, we really need this ecosystem perspective. And acknowledge too that uh, any of these places can be reservoirs for these resistance determinants or for resistant bacteria. And if we continue to use antibiotics or overuse antibiotics in one setting or the other, uh, that can provide the selection pressure that um, uh, leads to uh, these reservoirs continuing. Part three of the story. I feel like uh, that radio program, This American Life. <laughs> Act three. Uh, well, the good news in this uh, picture, this rather bleak picture, is that we actually know at a simple level what to do. Well, sort of. And, and what we need to do, of course, is to curb our use of antimicrobials. And uh, you've seen this, again, in Stuart Levy writing in, in the New England Journal. Uh, what is this now? Almost 40 years ago. You saw it from the Institute of Medicine. Uh, and, and note that the current FDA commissioner is here among the editors, that we have to have efforts on all sides of use, the human and the agricultural side, to reduce overuse and inappropriate use. And, and really, um, I think that uh, the science base is quite strong veering into the animal side here, that the animal use is important and contributes to the human threat from resistance. And people have often asked me in these contexts, like, tell me the study that, that demonstrates you know, the, the connections. Well, there's not a single study. There's an entire body going back decades. And it's very hard to describe because the, the pieces of the evidentiary chain are multiple. There's probably seven or eight different strands of evidence. So uh, uh, about 18 months ago, I started working with a medical student. We put together this annotated bibliography. I had Lori copy it in the back of the room for you. But it, it really is a, an attempt to say, this is the evidence base uh, and why it's important. But then um, others have looked at the same body of evidence. Re, uh, just in the last few years, Dr. Frieden again, uh, saying that the CDC finds there's a compelling body of evidence linking the antibiotic use in animals to the resistance threat in humans. Uh, as well as uh, uh, NIH leadership. So, from that bibliography, I want to just highlight one particular study that I think is the best review article. So if you really want to dig in deeper, um, I recommend this review article to you, uh, and it will come up at the bottom. But here is its basic argument. What's important is the very large quantities of antimicrobials used in modern industrialized food animal production. And what's also important is that many, if not most, of these antimicrobials are identical to or, very, or from the same classes as our human antibiotics, what the WHO calls medically important classes. So penicillins, tetracyclines, streptogramins, erythromycins, uh, uh, sulfa drugs, bacitracin, as well as, uh, to a lesser degree, fluoroquinolones, cephalosporins, even fourth generation cephalosporins. And the conditions under which, and this is the review article, 
the conditions under which these antimicrobials are used are exactly the conditions that we know select for and create persistent problems with resistant bacteria. And those can then go on to cause infections in both people and in animals. So it looks something like this. Again, I like the cartoons. So we all have gut flora. The animals we eat have gut flora. If we apply the selection pressure, it basically does the same thing in the animal gut flora as it does in human gut flora. It's going to select for these resistant organisms. And then those resistant organisms, we know, again, from this evidentiary chain, end up contaminating the meat supply and as well as the soil and the broader environment, because we take the manure from those animals and spread it around quite a bit. Whoop. And then can come to us that way too. And actually, this is probably not quite accurate because it's a little more complex. We have some evidence that there's a two-way uh, transfer. So in, you'll see later in some cases there are bacteria like MRSA that, uh, that travel from the humans back to the farm environment as well. So how do you think about the scale of this problem? Well, for a long time we didn't have good data because the FDA didn't collect and report data on where antibiotics are used. But that changed in 2008 with the passage of a law called ADUFA, the Animal Drug User Fee Act. It's called ADUFA. And so now, every year, about this time actually, uh, FDA releases data that they've collected from the pharmaceutical industry on the sales of antimicrobials, including in agriculture. And what they have found consistently over the last three years is that the animal use is the vast majority of the use overall, if you just look at it in terms of volume. And no, that's not the only way to slice it, but it, it is one way to slice it. So, in short, 80% of the total antimicrobial volume is in animal agriculture, 20% in humans. And you know, there's a lot of protestations from the pharmaceutical industry and the meat industry that, oh no, these are not human antibiotics. Well, actually, the majority are. There are some non-human relevant classes, like the ionophores, uh, and these are used in animal environments to put into animal feed, but so are penicillins, tetracyclines, macrolids, etc. And in fact, um, the latest data I'm laying out for you here, and you can compare the human side and the animal side. So you'll notice that uh, cephalosporins, quite rightly, the use in humans dwarfs the use in animals, but 60,000 pounds a year is not an insignificant amount of cephalosporin use. And then you look at tetracyclines, 12 million pounds a year used in the animal setting. Penicillins, almost 2 million pounds, as well as some others. Here's the ionophores, these non-human critical. Look at this, though. 3 million pounds, the FDA refuses to split them out. They don't give us the information. And why is that important? Because in this not independently reported class are um, quinolones, streptogramins, and other human antibiotics. And they're, they're keeping them non-reported uh, out of, uh, I guess, courtesy for the pharmaceutical industry, um, which claims it's confidential business information. So, that review article said that these are exactly the conditions for ripe for selection. Huge volume of use, often the same categories or classes or identical antibiotics to the ones we rely on for human treatment, and uh, routine use at low doses, often in animal feed. And so, What's, what's our take home message here is that the way that we've created f for um, raising most of the animals for food in this country now relies upon 
uh, for better or for worse, uh, the routine use of, of these antibiotics. And this doesn't have to be. There's an enormous variation between countries, kind of uh, 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 supporting the idea that it doesn't have to be the way that it is in the US, for example. But even in Europe, which is uh, sort of farther down the trail of reducing overuse, there's quite a huge variation. So for, in these data, there was almost a 15-fold difference measured as milligrams of antimicrobials per kilogram of meat produced. A 15-fold difference between the worst actor, the Netherlands, and the best actor, some of the Scandinavian companies. Um, and now the Netherlands, looking at this, has in the last three years really taken a concerted effort to reduce its use. And just in the last couple of years, it's been able to reduce its overall use by 70%. 70%. Where does the US fall out? Right here. The US use of antimicrobials is almost six times higher than Denmark's. Denmark is the largest pork exporter in the world. So it's not that they don't produce a lot of animals. It's that they produce them differently. So how are the antimicrobials used? Well, of course, if an animal's sick and you're a farmer and you've got a big investment and you care about the animals, you want to treat them. And nobody, that's a totally appropriate use. Um, you got to dive a little deeper. Uh, some of the therapeutic uses are injected. You know, if you have a sick cow, you give them an injection, and hopefully they get better with respiratory disease. But there are other therapeutic uses that are off-label. They're not actually FDA approved, but they're at the discretion of the veterinarian. So for example, for years until about 2000, you could use fluoroquinolones off-label for these unapproved uses. Then FDA stopped that. And until a year and a half ago, you could use cephalosporins off-label. And in fact, uh, how many had eggs this morning? Chances are that two years ago, those eggs would have been injected with cephalosporins. Or I'm sorry, the, the chick, that's not quite right. The chickens that you ate for dinner would have been raised from eggs that were injected with cephalosporins, even organic they still inject the, the eggs that become the chickens with antibiotics. So there's a little difference between Europe and the US. So, but third generation cephalosporins are very widely used in both places. Europe actually is using uh, fourth gen in animal production. The US, we've been pushing hard not to have that happen. And so far, uh, they haven't approved it. So the other big use, though, is, uh, for lack of a better term, what we call non-therapeutic use. These are uses of antibiotics for reasons other than treating sick animals, animals that are diagnosed as sick. So growth promotion is a big one. You've probably heard about this. Years and years and years ago, uh, in the 40s and 50s, there was some hard to document uh, evidence <coughs> that suggested that putting antibiotics in feed actually made animals put on weight faster so you could get them to market faster and make more money. And it became a routine uh, uh, and in fact dominant industry practice that continues till today. These are uses with no prescription, okay? The, uh, and they're at low dosages. The other FDA approved uses like this are for things like feed efficiency, raising animals to weight on less feed. And then metaphylaxis, uh, dosing entire flocks of herds of animals if you're worried that they might get sick. So for example, there's a lot of shipping of animals that goes on, which stresses them and makes them more prone to disease. So what do you do? You give them antibiotics in the feed in anticipation of the shipping so that you head that off. And so this is what we call non-therapeutic use. And in environments like this, where animals are pretty closely confined, there's very little infection control, you can see how their facilities where 
just the idea of confining the animals tends to make them more prone to disease. So the Danes have figured out ways uh, other than antibiotics to address this, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So here's the big shocker. Of all those 29 million pounds a year of antimicrobials used in animals, food animals, 90% are added to feed or water. They're not injected for sick animals. They're added to feed or water for these uses like growth promotion, feed efficiency, uh, and metaphylaxis. What is that, about 26 million pounds a year? So the concerns have been rising around this. Um, like I said, these feed uses have until uh, uh, just recently not been under any prescription. If you want to go to Fleet Farm or uh, uh, um, Menards, you can buy them by the bag. I've seen 20 kilogram bags of tetracycline. You can buy them over the internet. Um, very easy. And there's no dose control. You don't know how much any individual animal's getting because you don't know how much feed they're eating. There's very poor infection control because you're cramming literally tens of thousands of animals into the same building and they're in close confinement. And then there's no ecological control. So three quarters of those antimicrobials in the feed go through the animal into the manure. And what do we do with the manure? We spread it back in the land. Sometimes, in some parts of the country, we, the aerial spray, so they actually have um, sprinklers virtually nonstop spraying manure up in the air. And you can measure the drift of resistant bacteria airborne up to a mile away. So the other thing that happens with this practice is that we have widespread food contamination. Um, and so there's some likely actors, things that we think of as conventional foodborne illness like salmonella that are uh, oftentimes resistant and multi-drug resistant, campylobacter. But then there are some others which you wouldn't normally think of as foodborne illness, but which increasingly, increasingly there's some evidence that they, that they are, at least in some cases. So, Every, every, uh, every little bit, periodically, there's an outbreak of some kind of salmonella, typhimurium or Heidelberg. The latest one happens to be from a single company, Foster Farms, and uh, there have been over 450 cases so far. No, no deaths, thankfully. But more and more, we're able to see, uh, we're able to trace the uh, resistance profile of uh, the organisms responsible and in that way draw some linkages back to the farm environment where the meat is being produced or the slaughterhouse environment. Uh, this month Consumer Reports is going to do a big story. They've already got a preview on their website called The High Cost of Cheap Chicken and uh, they went out and tested through over 300 chicken breasts for six different bacteria, and then they looked at both prevalence and the, the resistance profiles, and these are some of the data. I don't want you to get bogged down in the details, but suffice it to say that um, about half of the breasts had at least one multi-drug resistant bacteria, 11% um, had two or more. Um, they, did find, they didn't find much staph, but uh, one of the staff was a MRSA strain. And, but of the E. coli, this was maybe the most interesting thing, 17% were XPEC strains. And so we're seeing that um, our concept of food safety has to be broadened, given everything that I've been talking about, beyond just the reportable diseases, beyond even just gastrointestinal illness, because obviously with XPEC, it's not GI illness that you're thinking about. It's UTIs, it's sepsis. And so it's not just food exposure, too, uh, that's going to be the clue for you as clinicians in, in drawing the link. Uh, 
So just one study. I could talk about six or 10 or 12 different studies. Um, MRSA, which is livestock associated, uh, I don't, people in your hospitals don't get uh, nasal swabs when they come off the farm, do they? If you know that they're from the farm, do you automatically culture them for MRSA? That's common practice in Europe. If somebody has a history that they are a farmer or live in a farm, they are presumptively thought to be colonized with MRSA until proven otherwise. At least in the Netherlands, where one in four clinical cases of MRSA is farm associated. So in this study uh, by Lance Price and others, they looked at this livestock associated strain, ST398, and uh, what it shows is that CC398 um, appears to have come from the human population where it was susceptible and then ended up in the livestock population where it was exposed to these routine antibiotics, including tetracyclines, and somehow became multi-drug resistant, including the tetracycline resistance, and then is being transferred back to the human population. And so, you know, keep your eyes open because there have been a number of these studies now um, kind of increasing the level of evidence. And here, um, those of you who are ID folks know Jim Johnson at the VA. He's been doing uh, similar work around uh, poultry associated, or what seems to be poultry associated resistant E. coli. Uh, and the study that I'm listing, because it's from Minnesota and Wisconsin chicken products, um, found that the chicken, the retail chicken, has obviously both susceptible and resistant strains of E. coli. And he and his co-authors compared the uh, fingerprints, the genetic fingerprints of the strains in both humans and chicken. And what they found, whoops, sorry. What they found is that the susceptible strains and the resistant strains in chicken looked pretty much identical, as you'd expect, right? But then the resistant strains in people that were isolated from humans more resembled the chicken isolates than they did the susceptible E. coli from isolated from people. So it strongly suggested that, uh, that there was a source of the resistant strains of E. coli in the chicken that ended up in the people. Fourth part, moving forward. So in the last 10 minutes or so of the talk, how do we think about what to do about this? I mean, I suppose we could just kind of retreat back and say, well, you know, that's out there. We're just going to focus on clinical use of antibiotics. Um, why? Because that's the majority of the use? Well. Not really, not by volume, because farm-associated antibiotic use never results in infections in our patients. No, that doesn't seem to be the case either. In short, I'm proposing that as advocates for our patients, we would be missing the mark if we didn't look at other ways to reduce use overall of the antibiotics because of this microbial ecosystem because the selection pressure is across society and not just in clinical settings. So there are, there's different ways of thinking about this. Um, one way to think about it is uh, to do all your eating out at a place like Chipotle. And uh, Chipotle sources much if not all of its antibiotic free pork from Nyman uh, Nyman pork producers, many of which are Minnesotans. Uh, they're in Iowa, North Carolina, several other states too, and there's about 700 of them. They've said that every time they open up a new Chipotle, it supports two more family farms of this size. There's other companies like that. Applegate has about 1,000 suppliers of uh, beef 
turkey and other products raised without antibiotics. And Organic Valley, in addition to being a dairy cooperative, also sells beef raised without antibiotics. So you add them all up, and it, it's not a small number. It's, it's, compared to the enormous size of the US food industry, it's not a big number either. And that's the problem with thinking that the market is going to take care of this. I mean, maybe over decades it might, but I'm not sure we have decades. In fact, I know we don't have decades uh, if we're going to keep our antibiotics effective. So the other, the other uh, options forward are policy options. And just like with tobacco, where health professionals became very involved with advocating for policy to change the environment, I think that there's a role uh, for health professionals to play that same uh, uh, function here. So let me talk about a few things. The low-hanging policy fruit, if you will, have kind of been seized already. So for example, um, in Europe, they used vancomycin in animals uh, unwisely. Uh, and they ended up getting many more problems with VRE infections in hospitals than we did. We never approved vancomycin, which is good. In 2000, the FDA, in 1995, the FDA approved fluoroquinolones added to drinking water for poultry flocks uh, over the objections of many in public health. Uh, Five years later, after their epidemiology suggested that this was causing 150,000 fluoroquinolone-resistant Campylobacter infections a year, FDA told the two manufacturers to take the products off the market. One agreed, one refused. It took five years for FDA to get fluoroquinolone products for poultry off the market, and they still use them in pigs. In 2012, the U.S. finally uh, ended off-label use of cephalosporins, like for injecting into eggs. They still use gentamicin. In fact, gentamicin use is probably more prevalent than cephalosporin use was. And again, this includes organic uh, uh, eggs that become organic chickens. Another low-hanging fruit comes to us from Europe, where they're 15 years ahead of us there. The Scandinavian countries, and Denmark in particular, started moving in the mid-1990s to end routine addition of antimicrobials to animal feed. That wasn't the first step. The first step was actually to take, to no longer make it possible for veterinarians to profit from selling antibiotics. And just that, just that step, had quite a big impact. Then they banned Virginia mycin, which is a streptogramin. And then AGPs is antibiotics for growth promotion. Then they removed the antibiotics for growth promotion, first from poultry and then from pigs. And you see what a remarkable result there was from these different steps. And if you look at the numbers, overall, they reduced the total use of antimicrobials by half. And I just told you that the Netherlands now is replicating that experiment, but they're aiming for a 70% reduction. Well, were there any really bad side effects from that policy action? The WHO wanted to answer that question, so they convened an extra expert panel in 2003. And what they concluded is that there was a substantial reduction in the risk to humans with fewer resistant bacteria on the meat, but with no impact on food safety, no impact on consumer prices, and virtually none on producers. And in fact, the meat industry in Denmark is stronger than ever. And they've expanded their production. So here are just some examples. So they ended Virginia mycin in broiler chickens. And they documented this decline in streptogramin resistance, which was pretty rapid, in Ephesium. They ended macrolids in pigs in pig feed, and similarly, they saw a reduction in erythromycin resistance among Ephesium and Ephicalis. Uh, 
Now, it didn't go down to zero. I mean, there's still these reservoirs. And part of that is because, at least initially, uh, they didn't see the downward trajectory that they wanted to see. And they realized that the producers were substituting heavy metals for antibiotics because the metals are antimicrobial too. And it was only when they took the copper out of the animal feed that they saw the decrease that they wanted to see. So you've got to be smart about this stuff. If you're going to change livestock production, you really have to do some research to find out all the different pieces. The other things they did in Denmark, remember those pictures of confinement barns with all the animals in it? They started giving the animals more space. They started putting in place stricter hygiene control, you know, booties on the feet. They started putting in better ventilation systems. They started weaning the animals later, uh, especially the little pigs, just a few days later. Not, not, these are baby steps, they're not big steps. But they do take some concerted effort, and that requires policy. So what's the situation been at the, in the US? Well, we still have, uh, the FDA has never removed, never removed an approved antibiotic since 1946 from animal feed, despite all these examples and evidence. They did find in 1977 that continuing to use penicillins and tetracyclines in feed was not safe for people. They made that scientific determination and then they put a proposal to ban them out in the Federal Register. That's kind of the way in government you communicate your intent. And Congress said, nope, don't do that. And in fact, they ordered FDA to stop moving forward pending further study. So in the mid 80s, the Natural Resources Defense Council petitioned FDA to act on its earlier finding. FDA denied the petition. And two years ago, uh, NRDC filed suit. Around the same time, FDA actually retracted its proposal to ban penicillin and tetracycline formally. And it said, quote, that it was gonna focus its efforts from now on on the potential for voluntary reform. We'll talk about what that means in a second. So NRDC sued and they won. The court ordered FDA to act on its 1977 scientific finding that using penicillins and, and tetracyclines in feed was not safe. But FDA immediately appealed and now the appeal arguments have been made and we're waiting on the decision. So it, uh, it's a real question mark where this is gonna go in the US. You know, either the decision's gonna come down and FBA is gonna do as the court says, or more likely in Congress, they're going to take action to vacate the court ruling. And then in 2013, two months ago, FDA uh, actually finalized its framework for what it means by voluntary action. Basically, it's asking the pharmaceutical companies that sell antibiotics for animal feed to no longer sell so many of them. And so we've been very actively trying to get FDA to put uh, stronger language into its regulations. We've asked them for a timetable on how it's gonna move forward if companies don't volunteer to sell more, fewer products. Um, but again, the jury's still out and we're right in the middle of the uh, period during which FDA is waiting for companies to tell uh, it whether or not they're gonna play ball. So that's a little bit long-winded. Legislation's the other way Congress can act, right? But it won't surprise you that in this, there are two great bills um, that have huge support in the medical community, including all these organizations. And, you know, it's always good to have more support for things like this, you know, in addition to the AMA and the Nurses Association. 
And basically what these bills would both do, and they're very similar, they would basically phase out these feed antibiotics that are also of human importance over time. They would not, contrary to some reports, take away the farmer's ability to use non-human antibiotics. And they would not take away the ability to treat sick animals therapeutically. But these bills aren't moving anywhere, basically. Not with this Congress. And so we really need leadership from Congress. Um, the, let me back up a second. And a leadership's not just legislation. You know, the budget for these federal agencies gets passed by Congress. So the other way that Congress can lead is by providing oversight, basically holding FDA's feet to the fire uh, to deliver on what it's promised. So if there's take home messages from the talk, uh, it's that we're pretty clear about what the goal is, right? We want to reduce resistance. We're pretty clear that the way to do that is to reduce use because use helps drive resistance. Uh, we're pretty clear that there's a, a, a scientific consensus, really, in the back of the room, 147 plus studies that animal use of antibiotics helps drive resistance just like human use. It's no exception there. What we don't have is the leadership. Uh, and we can always even put some more leadership from folks like you uh, to try to get more leadership from folks like them um, to start taking steps to reduce this overuse. So the voluntary steps have not worked. The incentives are not there for industry to volunteer. Um, and the, the rest remains to be seen. We're, we're kind of in a, a precarious place. So let me end there. Healthy Food Action, my affiliation is basically a network of health professionals designed to uh, educate and empower them to advocate on issues like this around food policy. So Rachel Gruel, who works with me in the back of the room, can answer any questions if you're interested in the work of the network. Um, and uh, you know we will be approaching policymakers around these sorts of issues and would welcome your help. So let me end there and take some questions. Why don't we begin with uh, questions from Minneapolis? They're stunned. Too busy eating their antibiotic <laughs> labor donuts. Anyone? Uh, it looks like there's one in the back involved? there in the corner. It, it strikes me that there's a, this is an industry that makes use of subsidies from the federal government. And with the farm bill, like the one that was just passed, I wonder if there's advocacy towards including language in that bill that would put pressure on the industry itself to to reduce the use of antibiotics or not get subsidies, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. The Farm Bill, for those who don't know, is probably the biggest food policy in the country. It's uh, almost a trillion dollars over 10 years. Unfortunately, you know, we tried for that kind of language, um, but the, uh, among, uh, uh, both in the Farm Bill, but also in another bill called the DUFA, uh, to get language around antibiotic resistance. But the leadership in the Senate in particular has been really uh, warning everybody on the key committee, the HELP committee, uh, not to address the resistance. So that chair was Senator Harkin. Senator Franken is on that committee. Tammy Baldwin is on that committee. So that when I talk about needing more public health leadership in Congress, I'm talking uh, in part about people like those. Um, I guess the good news about the Farm Bill, if there is any, is that it just passed, yet, what, yesterday, right, Rachel? The Senate. So now we've got another five years to try to change it. Um, but but that's, a, that's a tough nut to crack. There, there are other, the Farm Bill mainly funds USDA, 
and really here the legislation we're interested in is legislation around FDA, which is the agency that has authority over feed antibiotics. How does uh, feeding <coughs> cows corn as opposed to grass alter their microbial flora in their gut? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, the last time I looked at the literature on that, it was a little um, uh, inconclusive. There are some studies that suggest that putting them on grains, their ruminant stomach is not designed to eat grains. It changes the acidity, and the acidity may uh, change the ability of things like E. coli 0157H7 to survive in the, in the rumen stomach. Um, I'm not sure how it impacts resistance, though. Um, and I haven't seen particular studies on that. What I would say is, you, you know, all those corns and soybeans that grow in, in greater Minnesota and the rest of the Midwest, two primary uses. It used to be animal feed is the primary use, okay? So it's that whole industrial model, it's part and parcel of that model that include antibiotics. The other use, the bigger use now, though, is ethanol. That's where most of our corn goes, is to produce ethanol. Um, I have a question about uh, package labeling and consuming. Uh, something you said kind of surprised me about. Uh, so just to be clear, organic doesn't necessarily mean antibiotic free. And so we should be looking for labels that state chicken is antibiotic free. And if it does not state that, can we somewhat safely assume that it probably has been treated with antibiotics? No, the, the, the labels like antibiotic free are notoriously unclear and and little enforced. So I don't think you get much, other than the organic label, you get very little reassurance from a label like antibiotic free, um, which is unfortunate because that's kind of the shorthand that a lot of consumers want. Um, or don't let me swear you off organic um, other than the expense because organic meat has not been given antibiotics to the live animal. But there's this loophole where if it's chicken, they might have gotten antibiotics in ovo to the egg before it hatched the chick that became that organic chicken. So it is kind of this weird loophole, but it's not representative of the whole of organic production. I have a question from an ID perspective. It seems as though there's precedent for class specific, that is antibiotic class, such as restricting quinolones uh, action uh, if I were in a negotiation and getting pushback and I was going to lose this vote on the all or nothing, I would concede uh, tetracyclines perhaps, and if I could have penicillins uh, off uh, out of the picture, uh, is it naive or is it true that uh, tetracycline resistant doesn't necessarily extrapolate to other classes? Is that is that a fair assumption or is that not uh, not? A um, I, 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 I don't know specifically whether there's cross-resistance to the tetracycline that increases the resistance to other classes. Um, but I would say that, you know, it is tempting to want to kind of cut the losses around these older generic drugs that, that used to be pretty inexpensive for patients and were effective. But then we started, you know, using them by the millions of pounds and now they're no longer generic or effective. Um, the problem is that with the current set of rules in place, it's been very easy even for newer classes of antibiotics to get approval by FDA for use in animals, whether in feed or as an injectable. So, you know, the cephalosporins are one example. And I fear that what we really need is a whole change in mindset. And it's, uh, to my mind, it makes more sense to do what the Danish government did, which is to say, look, our overall goal is to reduce use wherever we can and not parse out one drug versus another. There are, as the human arsenal gets smaller, there are examples now where drugs that used to be veterinary only are now being used in humans. Maybe they weren't in the past because they had a higher risk profile. Uh, or they had to be administered uh, in ways that weren't very convenient. 
but now we don't have a choice. So if we say, well, you can use the, you can use drugs that aren't used in humans currently, uh, or you can use drugs that, you know, like tetracyclines, that are not terribly useful in the human setting anyway. You know, it's kind of a slippery slope. production by cutting antibiotics. Yeah. So if that's true, what's the driver in the USA to not decrease? Is it truly just sales of drugs, or is there some data about this production? Uh, um, that's part of it, I'm sure. Uh, part of it is just a lack of leadership. Um, ironically, in Denmark, it was the bacon and pork industry that partnered with the government to reduce use because they saw an export opportunity. They, they thought that in the future, the market for meat without antibiotics was going to get them a higher margin, which I think is true. And I, for the life of me, I don't understand why the US producers wouldn't want the same higher margin market. Um, I think the other thing is that the way the Danes have been able to do it is by integrating an incredibly sophisticated uh, surveillance system where the vets and the human uh, uh, medicine scientists work side by side and they coordinate to a degree that doesn't happen in the US. And so they've invested in data collection in surveillance and monitoring, and then they take the results of that and they go back to the farm. So they can literally track every use in the farm, which we can't. And so if a farm uh, exceeds, you know, if they're in the higher percentile in terms of their antibiotic use, they get what the Danes call the yellow card. I guess you could call it a penalty flag, but if you're a soccer fan, it's a yellow card. And you've got a year or nine months to reduce your use or you get penalized if you're a farmer or a producer. So that's, it's a different mindset where the public health goal has taken primacy over uh, other goals. No other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.